Welcome to you all from whatever part of the world you are from or whatever culture you identify with. And I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that I live, worship, and observe on the unseen land of the Shisha First Nation. Today we're doing deities in the sky. And yes, I know it says in the proclaim heroes and deities in the sky, but there's a lot of heroes. And I proposed this back when the world asterisk and stars have been about half the size it is now. And how big is it now? Now 9,020 asterisms, including 311 names in the Milky Way from over 400 cultures. So where are the heroes? There they are walking down the hall towards you. Okay, I know you mean the heroes in the sky. The deal is if I tried to give you all of the heroes and the gods, we'd still be here when the sun came up in the morning. So we're going to do the heroes another day. Now, gods in the sky are typically, and I've chosen the, the word god, that gender specifically, because they're usually associated with the planets, which are the brightest objects up there in our sky, which wander separately from the other stars and attract the attention of cultures. Yes, there are some goddesses up there, but we're talking primarily paternalistic cultures. So it's not surprising that mostly they are related to gods. And I'm not going to do solar system objects tonight because this is about asterisms and not stars. And I think you can figure out pretty much which planet is related to which god because they have names like Mars and Jupiter and Venus. It's pretty obvious. What is an asterism? It is a star or group of stars that has been identified and named in constellations are simply official asterisms. So we're going to do gods, but again, there's a lot. And so what I've done is I've created a list that I've given to the registrar who is going to give it to all of you who are at the class tonight so that you got all of the gods of the world. And in this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the deities that are familiar to you because I'm sure most of you are neo-pagans as I am and you, I have a pretty good idea of what pantheons you use. The two things I want to mention before I start, one is that if you're hoping that I'm going to take you back to some golden age or some time in history in any culture that where the people looked up into the sky and also the same thing, that's never happened in human history ever. And I'm going to show you multiple examples of that in the presentation today. The other thing is, in your repellents, we very strongly focus on getting people to try and reconnect with the natural world to the land and to the sky. Because so many people live in canyons of concrete and glass and steel and plastic with the overuse of artificial life and nature is just a bunch of shrubs and a planter somewhere and they might see the moon between the high rises and a few bright objects in the sky which they will assume are stars which probably are planets because they are the brightest things. But the other th thing is I, I'm imagining that probably most of you came here tonight because you're curious to see where your pantheon fits into the sky and that's fair enough. But you may also, I, in fact, I hope you're also thinking, well, how else can I use this? What can I do with this? And I want you to imagine your ancestors with a tribe, the clan, the people all around the fire, like you see here with the shaman, the knowledge keeper, the storyteller, standing there pointing up and saying, there she is in the sky, or he is in the sky. You can put these deities up there as part of your ritual. I would encourage you to do that and we can discuss that a little more later. So let's get started. I wanna start with prehistoric deities. And I'm showing you a picture here of Marija Gambias, who is a Lithuanian archaeoastronomer. And all we can say basically from these prehistoric times, there was no written language, so we don't have names of any deities that might be involved. We have art, we have statuary, we have structures like temples, which appear to have align alignments with certain things in the sky. And if we compare that to the oldest stories from that region and look for common themes and so on, we can often identify good possibilities for things in the sky culture. 
And Marija was very good at that. She has support of lots of other experts. So one, which she's proposed, is a bird goddess of the summer sky, which she identifies with the constellation Cygnus. And there's indication of solar cults associated with swans found on models and art all over Europe from the Urnfield and Hallstatt phases of prehistory. And Celtic mythology is full of stories involving goddesses and swans, such as the dream of Angus and the women of the pain and the children of Manana and Mac Lear and the grand one, the daughter of Lear and the Mabinogian. So it seems like a pretty good possibility. Another one is a great goddess of the winter sky. And this is associated to the constellation Orion, which is a name from the later Iron Age, but Neolithic cultures may have seen Orion as a pre-agricultural goddess representing regeneration and fertility. And Bellatrix, which is Gamma Orionis star here up in the um, right shoulder, sorry, left shoulder of uh, Orion as, as it's uh, up in the sky here is Bellatrix, Gamma Orionis. And it is a female warrior. So you can see the connection there. And some of the Olympic art shows female accompanied by two beasts, which could be Canis Major and Canis Minor. So Orion has those two constellations next to it and is often depicted as a hunter accompanied by dogs. So you can see the connection. And the last one I want to share is the snake goddess, which would be the constellation of the the snake charmer and serpent. Serpent is seen as a goddess holding a snake. And that was a common theme in ancient cultures. Now we speculate about all kinds of others, but I'm not going to get into that. These, this is a good sample. Let's move on to ancient Babylonian, Akkadian, Colchian, Mesopotamian skies. Now we have 2000 years of cuneiform tablets that give us star lists that are not exactly comprehensive in many cases. They're not co consistent. There's all kinds of regional variations, but there are all kinds of things which inspired later asterisms in the sky. And I want to start with a constellation, Virgo, because this is a constellation I want to use as an example of people looking at the same stars and seeing different things in the same region. So one, goddess is Baltus, which is represented by Virgo, Balat, Balat, Beltis, she's the wife of the god Bel, whose name means the Lord. This is roughly equivalent to Zeus or Jupiter in later cultures. Very ancient god, don't have a whole lot of specifics on him. Ishtar is also associated with Virgo in this region. She's an Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian goddess known as the Queen of Heaven and the goddess of love and war, who in later Hellenistic culture becomes Aphrodite. Shala is a Seleucid asterisk, and this is the descendants of Alexander the Great, a thousand years later. And she is made up of the stars of Coma, Berenice, Crater, and Virgo. And there was earlier a constellation or an asterism in the sky that the people in that region called the Furrow, Absin. She's a Mesopotamian goddess of weather and grain and the wife of the weather god, Adad. So there she is. You can see her holding a sheaf of grain and the star that's marked ear of grain that's alpha virginis speak of the brightest star in the constellation virgo and keep this in mind because in all of the different cultures that this uh constellation virgo appears you will see these themes for being repeated so other babylonian asterisms would include anamitu who is in the malapin tablets as um, uh, Mula, the Mula Anunitum and various other variations of the name. And it represents the god Anuniti or Ishtar Sipar, who is a Mesopotamian goddess of war and an aspect of Ishtar and a tutelary goddess of Sipar and Nanum. And she's made up of the stars of the constellations Andromeda and Pisces. I'm going to show you where she is in the sky in a second. Also, Dumuz or Tammuz which is represented by the asterism Lakunga, the hired man, which is made up of stars of triangle and Aries. So there in the middle is Ananitu, and then right next to her is the hired man. And the field there is the great square of Pegasus, and that is one of their asterisms in the, in the sky of that period. 
Belette, L.E., is it called the Increator of Heaven and Earth and the Goddess of Purification. And it is a quadrilateral of four stars. Now, Minma and Minmak in the Molapan tablets is the same quadrilateral of stars. She is an aspect of the Sumerian goddess Nimpersag, which is a mother goddess of the mountains. Also in that part of the sky is Dagon, who is the constellation of Cetus. And he's an ancient Syrian god of prosperity that's half man, half fish. So there's the constellation of Cetus, as we see it now, but you can see Dagon in there with the head on the left and the tail over by Stardifta on the right. But this here is the quadrilateral of stars, which are those two goddesses that I've just mentioned. Atargatis is the constellation of Pisces, later versions of the Smith place it in Virgo or Cetus, but it was originally in Pisces. It's a Syrian fertility goddess who later became the Greek Derketo and then went on into Latin culture with various variations of that name. And there's the great god Ea, who's made up of the stars of Aquarius, Cetus, Pegasus, and Pisces. It appears as Mugala or Gula in the Malapan tablets and has other names and other star lists from that period. So over on the left, you can see the hired man and that I need to that I showed you earlier in the field. And there in the middle is a great god AI with all kinds of things being created and flowing out from. Enlil is associated with the constellation Boötes. It's called Shupa or Supa in the Mulapan tablets. And it's a Mesopotamian god associated with wind, air, earth, and storms. His name translates as bright. And there he is, Shupa Enlil with um, the Star of the Abundant One um, as part of that. That's Arcturus. Ramana Ramanu is made up of stars of Aquarius, Cetus, Pegasus, and Pisces. He's an Akkadian god of the storm. Lamasu or Lama from the Malabin tablets is the star Vega in the constellation Lyra. It's a protective goddess who appears in multiple cultures there and is called the Lady of Light as part of the asterisk of she goat and Seleucid culture. And there she is with that she goat asterism in the middle there and that star. Lugarilla and Meslantea are netherworld gods, also mentioned in the Malabin tablets. Now, the people of that part of the world originally said Gemini, not as one set of twins, but two. So the greater twins were the upper half and the lesser twins were the lower half. And that continued in the Seleucid period. Here you see them with the great twins at the top with Castor and Pollux and the little twins being the feet of what we now call Gemini. It was many, many years before it got combined into one set of twins. Another pair is Lulel and Laterac. These two Babylonian stars are in the constellation Orion. They're both protective gods. And if we look at the sky, there at the top is the bull of heaven, which is what is now Taurus. But that's what they called it in those ancient skies. Below is the true shepherd of Anu, which is what we now call Orion. And between right there is Lulal and Laterac. The Naya is the constellation Corona Borealis. Um, this is a goddess of love closely associated with Inanna. And Umushta from the Malapan tablets is a deity of wild nature made up of the constellations Centaurus and Crux. So here we have in Stellarium a uh, representation of the sky there. And you can see that they didn't come up with a picture for him. I imagine they weren't sure exactly how to depict them in this sky, or maybe he was added later. But there you see him with the, the stars of Shulat and Kanyashir Alpha and Beta Centauri, the pointer stars. Pavel side was an important asterism for them, made up of the constellations Arrow, Sagittarius, and Telescopium. His name means forefather, chief ancestor, or presbyter. And there you see him. He is a centaur archer in a boat, about to launch his arrow with a scorpion. And you can clearly see how that was a precursor of the later constellation Sagittarius. They also had what they call the Seven Gods, which is the Pleiades cluster in the constellation Taurus. And 
while we do know that's what they call them, we're not really entirely sure what gods they're referring to there. Udu Shamash is up there, this is the Chaldean sun god, made up of the stars of Centaurus. Sababa is an important one up there, it appears in the Malappan tablets and appears in later Seleucid Skylark. As, and this is the constellation off Eucus. He was a war god originally, but when we get to Seleucid skies, while he's still a warrior up there, he's sort of been demoted to just warrior, no longer so divine. And there is the god Sababa. Taking a quick peek at Phoenician skies, again, we're going to show you an example of an asterism that's related to the constellation Virgo, and that is Astarte. And the start of your asteroid is a Hellenized form of the ancient Near Eastern fertility goddess Ashtar or Aftar, closely related to Ishtar. So now I want to talk about Egyptian skies. And this is, again, thousands of years of hieroglyphic records in this case. And the gods changed from dynasty to one dynasty to the next evolved over the years. One that would be prominent in earlier culture would no longer be prominent as you move forward and, and new ones will, will replace them. And we have examples of very detailed calendars that they had in Egyptian skies from the Ramesside temples and that sort of thing. And we can see exactly how they work and we can see exactly what they're called, what one of the problems we face is. We know for sure about a third of them exactly where they are in the sky. Another third, we're pretty sure. And another third, we've honestly no precise idea yet. People are still working on that. Also, later when the uh, troops of Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and the Ptolemies took over the rulership, you saw uh, a Greek influence coming. And you look at something like the Temple of the Ceiling at Dendera, you can see the, the merger between the Greek culture and the Egyptian, and we'll show that to you. So. I want to start with Sa, who is made up of the stars of Orion, Eridanus, Minosaurus, Lepus, and Columba. It's a much larger version of the constellation we now call Orion. It's a form of the god Osiris, who is known as father of the gods. Often depicted as a pharaoh, as you see here, in a boat, okay, whose consort is Sopdet, and that's represented by that boat next to it with the cow. I'll get back to that in a moment. And this appears in the Middle Kingdom onward. It's, it's depicted as a pharaoh because they're making an association between Osiris and the, the pharaoh because it's directly related to their views of the afterlife. I'll show you that in a sec. This is related to Anubis, who is associated with the king's major, although some experts from the 19th century onward decided it was Canis Major, not Canis Minor, which doesn't make a lot of sense. You'll see why in a moment. This is the god of death in the afterlife. And it's usually depicted as a canine or a man with a canine head. So you can see the connection. And the other is Kenemet or Kenmet, which is depicted on the ceiling of the Temple of Hathor as a cow in a boat with a star in its horns, which you see right here. And that is a hieroglyphic which is used to represent the star Sirius. You see that cow with the star between the horns and all kinds of other venues. It's also referred to as the half Cathar cow and Kenemet, which means darkness, is one of the 42 judges that judge the soul of the dead at the Hall of Truth. Now, it's associated to Canis Major, which is right next to Orion, and it shows up also when you're looking at Hathor which is related to the star Sirius and her name, which means House of Horus, is a cow headed goddess who was a predominant mother goddess in Egypt before she was replaced by Isis. So you can see the connection there with Kenemet. This then becomes Sopdet, also Sirius. And Sopdet or Satet was an archer goddess known to the Greeks as Sothis, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and it is an as another aspect of Isis whose consort was Saw. And she's depicted alongside Hathor in the circular zodiac ceiling of the temple in Dendera. And this asterism appeared from the Middle Kingdom onward. 
Now, so here's the sky. There you see sun. You see what we consider to be the three stars of the belt of Orion are actually three stars in the his Pharaoh's crown now. And his body extends down below the constellation of Orion into Eridanus and, and other constellations. He's standing there holding the Pharaoh's staff. There's Kenanek right next to him, following him across the sky. And you'll see that diagonally across the screen here is the Milky Way, which they consider a river. And there is a ferry boat, that line of two stars there down on the, on the lower left. And that's the ferry boat the Pharaoh will take to travel into the northern sky to the imperishable stars, which are the northern circumpolar stars that never set and therefore are considered immortal. So that's where he goes to achieve immortality. So there you see King Osiris in, on the Dendera temple. There's Sothis, the aspect of Isis, who is the archer. Anuket is also up there. It's made of stars of Pupis, Pixis, and, and Vila, and she's a goddess of the now flood. Horus is up there as an asterism. Anu, which represents him, made up of the stars of multiple constellations. He's a Falcon-headed god of kingship in the sky. And then uh, the Dendera temple, it's made up of stars of the constellations Karina and Columba, and it's depicted as a falcon sitting on a canopy. And Osiris is up there too, only Osiris is now a king. It appears in the pyramid texts uh, in the mortuary temple of Ramses II and others. And the Egyptians recognized that their constellation of Osiris, which was Orion and Canis Major with Sirius, disappeared from the sky for 70 days every year. And this is why in their religious ceremonies surrounding the embalming and, and internment of the, the Pharaoh, they had a 70 day period. And at the end of that period, they would take an ass and they would touch it to the Pharaoh's lips. And this was a called the ceremony of opening of the mouth, which would bring life back to them in the other world. And it was a 70 day period to, because they recognized that these constellations disappeared from the sky for 70 days and then were reborn at the end of that period. And it was representative, representative of them traveling to the afterworld, the afterlife, and then returning to life. Also, they have Osiris up there, which was Ptolemy's ship Argo, which was a huge constellation later broken up by astronomers into the constellations Pupus, Bela, and Carina, which are all parts of the ship, because he's traveling across the sky in that ship. So there's the pharaoh, the king, Osiris. And there is the goddess Anuket. And there is Horus on the uh, canopy. Selkis and Serket. Selkis is a funerary god goddess first mentioned in the first dynasty and very well known from a golden statue from the tomb of Tutankhamun. You see pictures of her everywhere. Serket is a goddess of fertility, animals, and medicine. Um, I believe she or originated in a deification of scorpions, so that's why she's got a scorpion on her head there in this picture. And she's made up of the stars of Virgo, Leo, and Libra. So that is up there. This is a crocodile god represented by the asterisk of Sac, which is made up of stars of Hercules, Lyra, and Serpents, and is on the back of uh, the hippo, which we're going to see in a moment. But there is another crocodile, Sac, or head up redly, which means lying on his feet. And that is made up of the stars of the constellations Hydra, Cancer, and Craterus. Show you that in a sec. And in amongst this is Tawaret, and this is a hippopotamus goddess asterism Reret, or Isis Jamet, made up of the stars of Draco, Corona, Borealis, Booties, uh, Hercules, and Lyra in earlier skies. And this is the one that has the crocodile on her back. It's probably a representation of a nursing goddess, a hippopotamus figure with a crocodile tail. They saw hippos the Egyptians as part of the pig family. So it was Reret means Sal, and that will be why. She was known as the Lady of Heaven or the Mistress of the Horizon. And there is another version of this in the later skies that is directly related to constellation Boogies, and I'll show you that. So there, you see the hippopotamus, 
uh, top left of the crocodile. That's where red and the crocodile. You see the mooring post, um, which is Arcturus connecting to the Big Dipper, which is the bull's foreleg, which circles the sky. You see Horus down here. There's Selkis, crocodile, hippopotamus. Now, if we move the sky up a little bit, I look further down, there's Seth, the other crocodile. But in later skies, the Dendera Temple, you see that Beret has become the guard. And the reason it's got that name is the star of the guard at the bottom there, which is Arcturus, which is originally derived from a Greek name, which means the guard. And that relates to a myth where that is guarding the two bears, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Isis appears in the sky, also made up of the stars of Karina and Bella, and she's depicted in, as in there to see the, the human figure standing on one of her hands. She appears in the pyramid text at the Ramesseum as well. There is a later uranographer, Hugo Gradius, who at the end of the 16th century gave his name to Mu Canis Majoris. Don't know what his motivation for doing that, but you, you may see that in your travels. Also up there is Min. This is depicted on the Dendera temple as well, made up of stars of the constellation Centaurus. It's a bullheaded man carrying a scythe and it appears to be a merger of the Babylonian god of agriculture named Girsu with the Egyptian fertility god Min, who was merged with the Greek god Pan ultimately. So there you have the Dendera temple. This mother goddess Isis right in the middle there. And there is Min Pan following her. Hapi is also in the sky in the Dendera temple. This is the god of Nile. And there you see Hapi. Harpocrates is there too. And the rulers of Ptolemaic Alexandria adapted the Egyptian gods, Horus the Elder, Horus the Younger, into Harpocrates, the god of silence, secrets, and confidentiality, and associated with the constellation Gemini. However, if you look at the ceiling of the temple of Dendera, this is what you see. And it's twins, but they're not both male, like you see in most cultures. One of them is female. But this is one of those where we don't know precisely who they are. We're working on that. Thoth is up there in his baboon aspect on the ceiling of the Dendera tomb. He was a Isis or baboon headed god of the moon, wisdom, writing, art, and judgment. So there you see Thoth's baboon right in the middle. Of it. So now I want to talk about Celtic skies. And this is a situation similar to the one with the prehistoric skies, because while they had a written language that they used uh, to mark monuments, they didn't have recorded history or, or documents of any sort. They used a class of people called the Druids to remember law and medicine and religion and all the you know, ancestry, all the things they needed to remember to remember. And the problem with that system is if some conquering people like, oh, let's say the Romans comes along and slaughters them all, the knowledge is lost. So while we have a lot of art and statuary and so on that does depict gods and goddesses and some of it indicating connections with the sky, it's difficult to figure out what the names were originally. And a lot of the records we have are things recorded centuries later by people who picked up the stories and wrote down the, the later versions of them. There have been more and more recent discoveries like the Sequani calendar and a whole series of bronze tablets at the headwaters of the Seine River and, and another one nearby, which gives us a calendar that they used, which was very detailed which shows their versions of lunar stations and, and fills in some of the blanks. We'll get to that in a moment. And I want to start with Orion in this case, because this is another example of how different parts of the Celtic world looked at the same piece of the sky and saw something different. Kernunus is a Gaulish asterism in the constellation Ophiuchus, and it's depicted on the gun-struck cauldron. Orion is also used to represent him. Hurin is the Prothonic god, uh, which is associated with the constellation Orion, the great hunter. Mavon, the Welsh god, deity of the winter sun, is represented by the constellation Orion. 
other Celtic asterisms, breed brigantu or, or um, brigantu, are associated with that uh, Sequani calendar that I just mentioned, um, with a specific asterism called Simone, which is the beehive cluster, which is this cluster right in the middle of the constellation Cancer. And they use the full moon's passage past this open, open cluster to mark the cross quarter festival day in bulk, halfway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. Crom Kruek is a very ancient Irish god whose name means bent, crooked, stooped, pile, heap, mound, stack. Probably a fertility god. This is very, very old. We have very limited information on who this was. Later, Christian writers made him into a bloody god of sacrifice, which is propaganda, I'm sure. But Danu, an Irish goddess who is associated to Aquarius, who is a mother goddess. Gwibniu, which is a smith god in Irish mythology, who was associated with the constellation Hercules, um, and also appears in Welsh versions of the Mythos Govani. Benan and MacLear is an Irish god of the sea who appears in Welsh mythology as well. A member of the Tuatha de Danan and is associated with the constellation Pegasus. And in the Welsh myth, it's, he's associated to the horse of the air, which is clearly a connection between Pegasus and that. Nectan is an Irish asterism which is associated with Aquarius because he's the husband of the goddess of the river Boyne. Tyrannus, the god of thunder and associated with a wheel, is a Gaulish deity who is associated with the Big Dipper. And you see again, this is also depicted on the Big Dipper, uh, on the uh, Gunnister Paulin. Now, this is something I wanted to bring to your attention. Back in 1922, the International Astronomical Union made a decision to make all of the constellations in the sky standard. There were too many different charts out there, too many different people with their own views of the sky. And they said, if we're going to share scientific information, we can't do that. We all need to have a standard chart. So they made 88 standard constellations. But then well, years later, 2015, they created a working group on star names to standardized the names of stars as well. And then a few years later, for their centenary, created a name exoworlds uh, event. And what they did is they took stars previously unnamed and sent one to each of all the countries in the world and said, go ahead and name it. And what came back were two Celtic gods. One is Belenos, who was the Gaulish god of light, the sun, and death. And this was a French entry. And that ended up being a star in the constellation Pisces. And Oma, which is associated with a star in the constellation Hercules. And he was a Celtic father god. Now, these are fairly dim stars, so I'm not going to show you where they are in the sky unless you want me to give me a call, send me an email, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll generate a chart for you. But they're not going to be as easy to see as some of the others, which is why I'm not specifically showing you that. Okay, now I'm going to show you Hellenic skies. And I'm going to start with this demigod here. And Greek mythology is full of interesting examples of how goddesses and gods are born from men, which doesn't sound entirely natural. You have incidents like Athena being born under the thigh of Zeus. And this is an example of one of those. Because what you have, as it's described by Ovid in his fasting, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hermes get together and they say, you know, Hyraeus there, he's a swell guy, we like him. And it's too bad he doesn't have a son. Maybe we can do something about that. So what they do is they take a bull hide and they ejaculate into it, all three of them, and this, Demigod is born to be Hyria's son, and his name, Orion, means to urinate. You can imagine how he became a superhero because he had to fight all these people and make fun of his name when he was a kid. <laughs> anyway, here we go with the constellation Virgo again, and we're going to start with Aphrodite, who is cognate with the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. 
but also appears in Greek culture as Concordia, the goddess of agreement and marriage, and Cybele, who is a mother goddess, and Demeter, who is a goddess of agriculture and the mother of Persephone, who is also identified in this constellation. And you can see the connection with Shell of the Maiden and her sheep of grain here, can't you? And Persephone, goddess of the underworld, known as the Romans as prospering. And Tyche, the goddess of luck. And Astrea. Now she's associated with two constellations. One is Virgo because she's associated with virginity, but also Libra because she's a goddess of justice, innocence, purity, and precision. And so of course she's associated with those scales. Other Hellenic asterisms, Aesculapius, uh, the great physician, um, son of Apollo, he's associated with Draco because of the serpent around his staff, which is the symbol of the medical profession today, but also for, for Apiuchus, the snake charm or the snake bearer because of that snake again. Apollo is associated with one star in, in Gemini, which is Castor, um, was called Apollon, and goes to various different variations of the name through different cultures over the years. The Romans called this constellation Apollo and Hercules because Apollo, Apollon was the Greek name for Castor and Heracles or Hercules was the name for the star Apollo. They also associated this god with the constellation of Eucus because it represented Apollo struggling with a snake. Artemis is associated with the constellations Canis Major and Canis Minor Marie, uh, Virgic Computers identified Orion as the Greek huntress goddess Artemis and her Minoan equivalent, uh, both accompanied by hunting dogs, which are represented by Canis Major and Canis Minor. Athena, now it surprised me, I went through these 9,000 plus asterisms and didn't find one that was directly associated with Athena. I'm not sure why she's a pretty prominent goddess, but um, myth has her slaying the serpent Draco and casting it up into the sky. So it is definitely associated to this goddess. Hecate is also associated with Kings Major and Kings Minor because they're the, her hounds, as you can see in the picture here. And she also was believed to have the ability to turn herself into a dog or a bear. Melokertes is a fairly minor child sea god, but if you're a sailor, very big thing because he was the aid of sailors in distress, and that's what's uh, associated with the constellation Hercules. Pan is associated with Capricorn, it's also known as Age of Pan because they were part human, part rural deities inhabiting mountainous areas. Phaethon, son of the ocean and Clymene and the sun god Helios, he begged his father to be given permission to drive his chariot and that didn't go so well and if you know the story falls from the sky. He's associated with Cygnus, Auriga, and Aridanus. Prometheus is associated with Hercules. He's the person who stole fire from the gods and got chained to a rock. And there is a myth that has Hercules rescuing him. Triptolemus and Jason, that would be Gemini. Triptolemus is a demigod from the Elysian Mysteries who presides the sowing and milling of wheat. All right, let's do Roman gods. And now we're, we're, we're starting to see themes repeating because we're having earlier deities associating themselves with newer ones. And we're going to start with Argo and Ceres, who is Ceres Plendifera Dea, Ceres, the bright goddess, a goddess of agriculture, grain, crops, fertility, motherhood. Can you see the connection with Shala again, a handful of grain? Diana, Roman equivalent of Artemis. Impanda, which is an aspect of Juno. Fortuna, who is a goddess of fortune, luck, and fate. Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, art, school of justice, and commerce. And also Pax, the goddess of peace and prospering, which is the Roman version of um, Persephone. French astronomer Joan Lalonde associated this with Corona Borealis, just as a matter of interest. Other Roman asterisms, Amphitrite, who is 
the goddess of the sea in life of Neptune is associated with Delphin as the dolphin. Corona Borealis is Bacchus's crown. Juno also was associated with two, two other asterisms in one Roman zodiac. Aquarius is depicted as a goose, which is one of her totems. And then another this Aquarius is a peacock, which is one of her totems. Sancus is associated with the god Hercules. In the sky, um, or the hero, I should say, Hercules, uh, it was a god of trust, honesty, and oaths. Venus and Cupid was a very uh, prominent asterism in Roman skies, Venus being the goddess of love, uh, Cupid the god of desire. And there is uh, one author who wrote Urania, which is a textbook on astronomy from 1754, associates it with Gemini and only says, it comes from old astronomers, which is pretty vague. So I'm not sure who made that connection, but definitely in Roman skies, this was associated with Pisces because the myth has fishes rescuing these two. Vesta is associated with Ara, the altar. She's the goddess of heart and home. Okay, Norse skies. Norse skies. We don't have very much information on them because when the Christian wave moved across Europe and into their territory, they tended to destroy anything that was related to Norse mythology. And a lot of the knowledge that they had of stars was lost. And we know that great navigators made it all the way across the Atlantic and, and to Greenland and Iceland and so on. Um, we know from what records survive that they had these records of stars. What little we have has been recovered from Icelandic culture. And my colleagues um, who have helped me with the, the World Asterism Project, um, Jonas Person and uh, Christian Etheridge, have made great um, strides in, in making connections with the stories from these regions and what little survives. The skies still do look rather empty, and there's nothing much we can do about that. We're still working to try to recover what we can. But here's what we got. The Jazzy um, is a character who captures the goddess Idun with the assistance of the trickster Loki, and then the gods who are upset send Loki to rescue Idun, and Jazzy is killed. And Odin throws his eyes into the sky to make amends to his daughter. Scotty, so that becomes the stars Alpha and Beta, Geminor, Castor, and Pollux. Envy is a Swedish god representing fruitfulness and life force related to the gods Freyr and Freya, who is represented by the Ingsvagen, which is the Big Dipper asterism. And Freya and Freya also ride in carts drawn by cows. Odin is associated with the Big Dipper asterism. There are all kinds of names that are used for him throughout Norse culture that indicate that he is associated to a wagon or that he is a wagon driver. Um, so it's pretty easy to make a connection there. Now, here's one of those modern ones. This is that name Exo Worlds uh, campaign of the IAU again. And the star Epsilon Eridani is, didn't have a name other than the buyer classification. And when they put this out there, it came back with this name of a Norse sea goddess. This one I'm gonna show you because this one is easy to see. There's Eridanus wandering across the sky from the constellation Orion on the left there and that arrow was pointing right at the sea goddess Ram. Thor is up there, and he is also associated with the Big Dipper because the name Carl Wagen, which means man's wagon, uh, is associated with him. All right, um, ancient Vedic skies, they had a very detailed sky. They had very detailed lunar and solar calendars that overlapped. It's a very complex system. I'm not even going to attempt to try to explain it to you now, but it's out there. And they were very interested in how other cultures viewed the skies. So they translated Chinese um, documents on astronomy and Persian and Greek and on and on. And so you will see those 
influences in some of these in the later versions of these? And we're going to start with Virgo again with the vast star or Vishka Karma. And this is a pair of um, Vedic gods who are uh, craftsmen, basically. And it's associated to a nakshatra, a lunar mansion called Chitra, which means the bright one is a shining jewel, which is Vir uh, the constellation Virgo, specifically the star Spica. So there's Virgo again. Other Vedic asterisms, Agni, the god of fire, appears as the star Beta Tari, the second brightest star in the constellation Taurus, or Zeta Orionis, Almatak. In the constellation of Orion, that's one of the three stars of the belt. It's the one on the left if you're looking at Orion in the sky. He's associated with the nakshatra or lunar mansion, uh, the covers, Kritika, which is the Pleiades cluster in Taurus as well. So there's two connections to Taurus. Bachara Mata is the star Beta Leonis Denabola in the constellation Leo. This is the Hindu goddess of chastity and fertility. There's what Leo looks like today. There's the, the Nebola right at the back end there. Baga, the Vedic god of wealth and marriage, is related to their nakshatra Purva Flaguni, first reddish one, which is also in the constellation Leo. And there's Leo, and there is the nakshatra. Indra, the Vedic god of storm, related to their nakshatra Chiasta which means eldest or most excellent, is three stars in the constellation Scorpius, including the brightest, which is Antares. And if we look at Scorpius here, there's Antares, the star either side of it, that's there, not Chakra. Prajapati, this is a complicated story where in one myth, Prajapati, who is an aspect of Brahman, takes the form of a male deer to pursue his daughter, Rohini, which means red one, who changes herself into a female deer to escape them. And then Prajapati's good twin Rudra is hunting them to try to prevent Prajapati from doing something nasty. And they're associated with the constellation Orion because that's going to be the hunter. And the deer is the red one, that's the star Alpha Tari. And you can see that the stars in the belt, I've already mentioned Agni being one of the stars in the belt, but the others are Soma, Moon or Celestial Drink, which is the middle star of the belt, and Vishnu, which is the star of Mentaka. Going into detail on those, Soma, that uh, star over on the left-hand side there is also used for the, the Hindu god of the moon, night vegetation. And the name Vishnu, that is the, um, God of, who is a preserver and sustainer of life, and that's Mintaka, which is the star on the right, as you're looking at the three stars of the belt in the sky. You've got Tara up there, who is Zeta Draconis in the constellation Draco, who is the goddess married to Braspati, the planet Jupiter. And you've got Ushas. Um, this is a Vedic Rash, which means a constellation. This is that um, Hellenic uh, influence coming in. It's the constellation Capricornus specifically, and this is the daughter of Prashapati who's turned herself into a deer to, to get away. Yana, the god of the dead, is related to their nakshatra Barani, which means bearing star, which is three stars in Aries, 35, 39, 41 Ariadis. And these show up in lunar mansions in multiple cultures. So let's quickly take a look at that. There's the line of stars, which is the constellation Aries, and these three stars at the end, those are the ones that I'm talking about. Now, in Chinese guys, they have hundreds, around 300, depending on the dynasty you're looking at, um, asterisms called symbols. And they represent everything that's down here on the ground. If, if you can find it down here, they put it up there. And in the older asterisms, what they tend to do with the stars in the asterism is they give them names and give them ranks. So, for example, you'll have Empress and First Consort and Lady in Waiting and then, you know, Serving Girls and all this, this list. Or you'll have Emperor and Seneschal and, you know, 
first council or whatever. Um, in later skies, what they tended to do is take the name of the constellation and number of the stars. I suppose because it was an easier way of doing things. You do find some references, but not a lot to gods. There was one specifically that I want to show you. And it's the Northern Dipper of Beidou, which is the big dipper in our modern Western skies. Goes back to early records from the 21st and 17th century, but by the 9th century, Buddhist astrologers had de definitely connected this asterism with longevity. And when a person was born, they take a look at where the constellation was in the sky and they figured that certain stars would be related to that birth and would indicate how long that person would live. And all of the stars were named for a goddess and had multiple names or aspects, as you can see here. And the second star from the end, from the handle, it was just a double star, Mizar and Alcor, that was a goddess, a Kang, opener of heat or military star or danger. And the lesser star next to it, Alcor, was Fu, assistant. And here's one of those modern examples from the Mexa worlds. This is the char, the Chinese star Xie, which is in the constellation Lyra, was given its name. And Xie is the goddess of the sun. I also want to take a quick look at Japanese culture. They did not have a lot of asterisks in the sky. It was not at all like Chinese and Korean skies. They had lunar mansions, definitely, and very little besides there were some local variations where they identified certain patterns or stars, but they definitely had the goddess of female attendance in the sky. And this was the constellation Orion and the hem of her cloak was the sword of Orion. And they also had Sarah Papiko no Kami, which is a Japanese god with a monkey-like face. And that was the highest cluster in the constellation Taurus. Okay. If you are interested in getting more details on these or anything else, for example, if you're looking at maybe trying to take a particular subject and relate it to a certain ritual that you're developing and put that in the sky, this is where you need to go. This is the RESC World Asterisms list. There's a handbook describing all of the asterisms in detail. There is a second volume, which is a list of world asterisms, which is a PDF or an Excel spreadsheet table. This gives you the precise location, right ascension, declination, basic details, plus the list of names of the Milky Way, 311 of those. And there's a third volume, which is World Asters and Sky Cultures, a resource list with over 400 sky cultures. So if you want to know what exactly, what part of the world this culture is from, this is where you would go. And if you want to know more about that culture, this will give you all the written online and so on uh, resources you can use to discover more for yourself. Go to this link or go to the main website of the RASC, RASC.ca, go to the search box, put in the world, ask for some project, enter, that'll bring up a page where you can download these for free. This is a living project, a work in progress. We are constantly trying to recover the lost information that I alluded to earlier in the and keep up with the new names that are being created. This is what my inbox looks like at the moment. You check that with me in a month from now, it's going to be even bigger. But it's a work in progress. It's a, a uh, labor of love, and, and we're happy to share it with you. I also want to mention, since I started this, I've had people contacting me saying, I am this aspect. I haven't told anybody yet. I think you might be interested. And the answer is absolutely. So if you, I, I've heard one of you mention, gee, wouldn't it be interesting if we created Wiccan constellations? Yes, it would. And if you do that, or you've already got some of you in your, your companion views, tell me because we're trying to put all those views of the sky up there. So if you need to contact me, here are various different emails you can use. I think you all probably know my email anyway, but these are ones that you can use to contact me. And now I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. What about Nuit? Um, Nuit, the Egyptian goddess of the night sky. She isn't 
related specifically to a set of stars. She is the sky. All of the stars in the sky are her body. So it's it's sort of like she's got everything up there. There, there is another um, culture that, that does that in, in northern North America. Um, the, uh, the, there's a whole group of tribes up there that see one asterism in the sky. It's called the tailed man. And it's made up of 18 constellations that spread over the entire sky. So, I mean, that, that has happened in several cultures, but yes, uh, that's, that's a very good point. But she, uh, the reason I didn't mention her is because she is the sky, basically. Um, and somebody else has said, yes, doesn't she represent the whole sky? Absolutely true. Take care, this is Amber. Yeah. Um, this is a, a load of information. This is, and wonderful resources. That's why I'm sending you a list. Yes. <laughs> you have to take notes. Can you give us any, um, oh, practical hints or guidance how to use this information in spiritual practice? You mentioned doing ritual, but could you expand on that or talk about other ways that we can use this knowledge or connect with the sky gods or goddesses or make it part of our practice? Well, one of the things you're trying to do, especially in a large group ritual, is, is, is involve everybody and get everybody to, to focus on things that, that help them get into this. And I mentioned one thing. Um, earlier, and that was you can identify a particular deity that you want to relate to that particular event or that ritual, and you can then focus their attention on it. Like, you don't have to have a statue in the circle or a, or something in there. You can say, there, she is, right up there. You know? and, and you can take a laser pointer, a five-watt pointer. I use that those all the time in my, my uh, teaching. And say there, see, or you can even just get a powerful mag light or something, you know, and point it at the sky and direct people's attention to it to help them um, find it. And then it's there over their heads. You could you could do a meditation, and you could take them actually through the stars. I mentioned uh, Beidou, the, the Northern Dipper, and there was actually in Chinese um buddhist practice there was a meditation where you went through a dance and went from one star you imagined yourself going through each star visiting each goddess as you went um, and there was all kinds of other examples of that sort of thing so you could have everybody lie down look in the sky and take them on a journey through uh, the stars these are usually assembled in as part of the story, right? You, you saw examples of that as we went through. There is Orion, but Isis is following them. And there, you know, all these different um, characters that are, that are part of the story, you can take them through that meditation. One of the things that, that you see in, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead is they specifically describe that journey the Pharaoh takes and, and takes that boat, that ferry to the imperishable stars. So you can, you can do stuff like that. You can take them completely out of this world and into, you know, an astral one uh, quite easily doing that sort of thing. Um, somebody here is asking, uh, so many asterisms are related to Orion. It's because it's seven of the 21 brightest stars in the sky, basically. Um, so, and it is visible, it is so close to the celestial equator that it is visible from both hemispheres. Uh -huh. So everybody all over the world can, can see it. And um, although your perspective depends, determines what you see in the north, extreme north and extreme south, it appears to be a figure standing up with a belt often described as male, but in, in ancient Arabic skies, it was Al Jauza, who was the female giant, and the three stars is a jewels around the waist. Um, but if you're in equatorial regions, the three stars of the belt come up this way. They come up like 90 degrees to the horizon, and it's normally identified as a plow or a spring trap or something of that sort, because, because it's turned sideways and the perspective is different. So um, Taurus is, is the constellation, modern constellation whose stars appear in most 
places uh, elsewhere in the world, and that's because it's got the two uh, closest star clusters to Earth, the Hyades and the Pleiades. So, you know, the the Hyades is is uh, seen all over the world, and the Pleiades also. I mean, if you were rating it by just asterisms, not constellations, Pleiades would be number two easily. It appears that we're usually is female, not always, but usually for some reason. And um, so yeah, it comes down to what stars are the brightest. And uh, but then if you're in African cultures, uh, they tend to identify single stars as characters in the story. And then the asterism is all the characters in the story. So I didn't give you an example of that tonight, but um, they, they do have some gods. You do have cultures in Africa that don't have anything up there because those are the eyes of the ancestors looking at us. And we don't talk about the dead ever, you know? So, I mean, you can find a very complex cosmology in your Reuben culture, which gave us the modern religion. It used to be called Santeria, but it recovered their original name, Lukumi. And mm -hmm. they don't do two asterisms. Uh, someone says, what about Mesoamerican cultures and the deities as they relate to the perspective in the sky? Check the list. Um, there are problems with that because a lot of that, the, the ancient uh, Aztecs, for example, they had records all over the place. And the first thing that the Spanish did when they got there was burn them. Um, there were priests that worked with the survivors and recovered records and those made their way to Europe where they were largely ignored and quite often, I mean, the, the Paris Codex, which is one of the most complete, if you can call it that, was found moldering in a, in a chimney corner in the 18th century in, in the main library in Paris. And part of it had been ruined as a result. So, I mean, again, those guys, if you look at our handbook are, are kind of empty because we've lost a lot of stuff but we know that there was more up there and, and we are gradually recovering some of it with the help of um, our ethno-astronomical and, and archaeo-astronomical colleagues who are looking at, you know, more recent excavations and so on. But um, they had a detailed calendar. They had a 52-year cycle and the two, uh, the, the sword and the bell of Orion were two sticks that they used to rub together to start the fire to start that 52-year cycle. And, there's all kinds of stuff. The paddler gods are, are paddling along the Milky Way. You'll find it in the list. But um, yeah, I, I didn't want to mention those tonight because in my, my uh, relations with, with um, neo pagans over the last half century, I haven't seen a whole lot of people using those, but, but they're right there, you know, and, uh, and we got them. No problem. Um, you have modern versions of that, the, the, the ancestors that, that are, sorry, the descendants of the Inca and the Mayas and, and the uh, Aztecs are still out there and they have more modern versions of those stories. And, they, and just like the ones I've shown you, there's all kinds of variations. So um, yeah, check out the list when, when uh, Amber sends it, or when uh, Roland sends it to you, because we, we've got some in there for sure. Anybody else? Another question, Care. Um, there's, of course, a huge amount of diversity and variety in all these different cultures and their asterisms, but there's also a lot of parallels uh, between cultures. Yeah. You know, like, like Virgo being associated with so many key goddesses. Um, is it your thought that very early in human hist prehistory, there was a circulation of knowledge and information and stories and myths among astronomers like thousands of years ago? And that leads to some of the parallels we still see? A lot of people, a lot of my colleagues have suggested that in investigating that there is one um, gentleman out there whose name eludes me at the moment, but he's collecting the stories, not the not the asterisms like we are, but the stories. Um, you talk to people like Dr. Rosalind Frank uh, at the University of Iowa, who is an expert on Basque culture and skies, but also on, on uh, Delaware uh, First Nations in Lenape. And she talks about um, the bear cultures 
that you see all over the world and how those relate to you know the stars in the sky it's um so yes i mean as i mentioned right at the very beginning when you're dealing with the the neolithic stuff all you've got is some art and some statuary and you've got alignments and the problem of alignments is i could take your house right now and show you about 400 alignments to stars in the sky because there's 4,000 stars in the sky every year and it's easy to do but that doesn't mean that you or anybody else that built the house intended those the next step is okay these are the possible alignments is there anything in their stories that actually relate to that and then you go ah there you go you know so you know uh in the 18th century, when they first came up with the idea of trying to find those alignments in the sky and somebody descended on Stonehenge, they came up with hundreds of alignments, but most of them were probably totally useless. We know that it's aligned with the winter solstice. Yes, I said winter, not summer, because the archaeology around it is proved the feasting was uh, the remains that we've got indicate the feasting happened in the winter, not summer. So we know from the sort of food they were eating. So of course, if you turn around and look the other way, it's just, it's aligned with the summer solstice too. I'm not saying it's not, but it's it was pretty evident that what the intention was. And that's the sort of thing you have to do. You have to combine it with all these other things to try and figure that out. There, there was a, a temple in uh, one of the Mayan temples is associated with um solstices and equinoxes, but also with uh, Venus. And uh, there's a whole lot of similar temples in the area that are sort of like copycats of it. And so they sort of originally assumed we are certain these are aligned. They actually describe these alignments in, in, in the inscriptions that we have on this. All the others must be aligned too. But when they went and actually took the time, they found out all that what had happened is people said, I want one more like that. And they built it to look sort of like the original, but they didn't bother aligning it. So th this is one of about 14 that is actually aligned, the others aren't. Mm. So, you know, you have to be careful with this stuff. But, um, yeah, somebody says in the chat here, um, there are people uh, translating Mayan texts from carvings on monuments. And the Mayans did have books, as I mentioned. They had uh, a lot. Of, of written uh, material in their in their kind of I, I want to say hieroglyphic but it's not hieroglyphs but you know what I mean pictographs. Um, but the conquistadors burned a lot of it. There were some that that were missed uh, that were saved, but weren't not and then a lot of those weren't necessarily taken very good care of. But more and more, they are excavating temples where they're finding more inscriptions. Like, for example, they found this huge circular stone in, in uh, Mexico City a few years back that, that has a lot of information about the sky and how the mother of the sky gives birth to the stars every night. And, you know, so um, we are still recovering stuff. That's why it's a living project and we're still growing because we're still recovering stuff. Imagine how difficult this is Rowan. Yeah. Imagine how difficult it would be to learn English if you only had inscriptions on monuments to go on. And that's essentially oh, yeah. what they've got of the Mayan language. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I, I'm looking at texts that go back, you know, to um, the days of Dion Fortune and, 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 and earlier where they had all kinds of wonderful ideas about how what Egyptian religion was and how it worked and, and most of the terms had to be not terribly accurate because they couldn't really translate these things accurately then. Um, and we still have a lot of blanks. I mean, I showed you one of them from the Dandera Temple we've got these two figures of the thing we don't know, you know, but um, all it takes is one more discovery with a few more pieces and suddenly everything starts to, you know, slip together. And this is one of the reasons a lot of people believe that what we're doing here with this World Astros project is important because it's allowing them to see the parallels between the cultures, going back to what Amber said a moment ago about um, these stories um, being shared and travel. I mean, you, you can see this uh, from my colleagues in, in Australia who have shared like two decades worth of work in, in recovering these stories. You can see them describing uh, people traveling across a land bridge from Asia to Australia 
which means it happened during the ice age when the oceans had shrunk. And, and by taking a piece of the story and matching it to what we know of world history that way and what was happening in the sky at that time and, and stars that they were identifying as having particular characteristics related to the seasons, we know that this time scale is accurate and that they're act this is a story that actually goes back to them. And so, you know, um, people did carry these stories. And we know from more recent days, I've, I've already mentioned it, you know, the, the Indians came up with a very elaborate sky culture, but then they went, sent their scholars abroad and brought back and translated Hellenistic and Ptolemaic and Arab. Chinese did the same thing. I got this, this chart that I was looking at the other day that compares Chinese sky to Zodiac from Ptolemy to Indian. All, all in one circular chart. And, and it's not the same. The, the Chinese do not use a zodiac like uh, you use in modern astrology, for example. They have a completely different system that's based on years, not months. But, um, but they were interested in it. They definitely had these uh, foreign astronomers in their courts. So it's not difficult to imagine it happening in ancient skies, because we know from monuments that we see all over Europe and, and elsewhere in the world that they were aligning it with solstices, with equinoxes, with phases of the moon. They definitely were interested in what was going on in the sky in uh, Neolithic times. No, no question about it. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I just want to mention one thing that that I've gained from this whole understanding of sky gods and goddesses, and particularly uh, deities that reside in the stars. Um, I'm thinking of Astrea, Hecate's mother, and I'm thinking of Nuit and so forth. One thing, one gift they give us is that if we can transfer our perspective to that of the star gods, or if you prefer, if we could uh, pretend we are the ancestors looking down through the stars, um, that instantly gives us a different perspective on what's happening around us. It gives us distance. And I find myself from time to time uh, getting very caught up in current events and the minutia of political battles and, you know, all the issues that people are agonizing over on the planet. And sometimes I just need to step back. And a way to do that is to flip my consciousness up to the stars, look through the eyes of Nuit or Astrea or Helios or someone and take a deep breath. And from that perspective, you can release a lot of anxiety and tension and look at the big picture. And I think that when you come back to an earthbound perspective, then um, you're in a better place to do something about the issues around you or to be an activist or a justice warrior than if you just allow yourself to be swept away by the anxiety and the conflict and the, you know, the outrage and so forth. So that's something useful that I found with the sky gods. It's a very um, common perspective that you see in between the 8th and the 11th centuries in the Arabic skies, uh, and, and even older. They, they, one of their um, great astronomers, Al Sufi, who translated Ptolemy, and that's the reason we have Ptolemy today, is he translated the, the original text, which is now lost and made the Almagas. So he, he called it the, the Book of Fixed Stars, Al Sufi. Uh, it's about 936. And in it, it's got beautiful illustrations um, of the sky um, drawn in there. It's just a gorgeous book. But in every single case, he shows the constellation as viewed from below. And also as if you went up in the sky and were looking back down in the other direction. And 
Most of the constellations are depicted as viewed from above, not the side, like a lot of other um, cultures commonly do. Like Altharia, which is the Pleiades, you're looking at the top of her head and she's dancing, her arms are embracing the sky and they're spread out across the sky. You know, their lion isn't viewed from the side, it's viewed from the top. You know, so um, there are a lot of other cultures that, 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 um, do that. And, and uh, going back to the Mesoamerican stuff, I mean, you, you've got, I mentioned the paddler gods paddling across the sky, the Milky Way, to the primordial fire, which is the sword of Orion. And, um, you know, when we're talking about meditations and taking you out uh, of the everyday world and, and sort of escaping that, going somewhere else for a while, coming back. But I think that's a very, very good um, idea and a very important um, lesson to be taken from this. Okay, I think everybody's exhausted now. <laughs> so uh, again, if you if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. I, I'd be happy to. To answer them, if you you're getting a list of, with all the, the deities that I didn't mention, but they're, they're right there. If you um, yeah. want to design some sort of a ritual, and you are trying to figure out where in the sky this is and, and what season or how would I do that, I can very in, in seconds produce a, a chart for you from your location showing you exactly what the sky will look at at the time you want and what's up there and no problem at all. We can we can do that. Uh, be happy to do it. So uh, I, I uh, will share your contact information when I send out the file. Great. And I will do that as soon as I have the list of email addresses together for the class. Thank you. Everyone. It'll take me about an hour. Yeah. Emailed by the list, but if you take care of that, that would be that would be great. Yeah. So, so I have a question for you, Karen. Yes. Um, so you're referring to the file. Now, is that as complete or as as splendorific as your presentation tonight or are we going to get a recording or a pdf or you know that's that that's where okay i i can take this um powerpoint and i can i can uh share it with you guys if you're interested that's that's not a problem and um i want to take this recording put it on on open shot and, and edit it and then i want to put it on youtube so what i'll do is i'll just put it on my channel and give you the link so you can view it if that's okay and uh because I, I covered a lot of ground in a short period of time there's a lot of stuff there I, I recognize that so i i think it's a good idea to have it so you can go back and review it but yeah know, that's what i'm talking about to do that but but i, I i've had a lot of practice uh, editing uh, that stuff so no problem yeah sounds great thanks so moonbeam mage uh if you yes. uh, if you access the uh, the core files, the, the 9,000 asterisms and the 400 sky cultures, just be aware there will be a test. Oh, no uh, problem. <laughs> you know what? Next next week at this time, it'll be it'll be bigger. It, it is it is growing constantly. I, I put in work on this thing just about every day, and uh, I've got a lot of helpers and. Um, there are a lot of cultures that we have. We've just entered into partnerships with a couple of First Nations. Uh, Dr. Robert Cardinal, who's a, a Blackfoot astrophysicist, is helping us recover Blackfoot skies. Uh, Dr. Shane Pete, who is an educational specialist in the University of British Columbia, is helping us with uh, Salish skies. And, and you know, I mean, uh, there, there's, there's it, this time next year, it'll, it will be much, much larger. And, uh, and we're constantly linking things together that we didn't see before because we didn't have the information to do it. So, you know, it's uh, it's a work in progress, but uh, it's, we're making it as complete as we possibly can. We don't want to tell stories in detail because that's for the knowledge keepers of the, of the uh, people involved to do, but we want to let you know the stories out there so you can find it. So, and we want you to find the stars. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. I'll, be going right, I'll be right there looking for if my um, neighborhood indigenous communities are have been contributing. I'm curious here in the northeast of Turtle Island here in the, the I, Wabanaki Confederacy area. Someone's asking, what is my YouTube channel? Let's look for, oh, somebody's already uh, put it on it. Thank you, Andrea. Yes. I haven't put a lot of videos there lately. I've been doing them, uh, putting them elsewhere, uh, but uh, I'll put this one out there, no problem. All right. Thank you, everyone. Can I stop recording now?